Well, it's fantastic to be able to join you today. Um, our friends at Restore Church in the various ways and places that you're meeting and however you're doing it today, thank you that I get to be able to speak to you. My name's Anthony Delaney. I lead Ivy Church based up in Manchester. Been friends with Ian and the team for many years now. Uh, Ian got behind our vision, a new thing in the UK to be able to help us to help other church leaders learn how to make disciples who make disciples, plant churches that plant churches, raise up leaders that raise up leaders, which is really what we're going to be looking at today as we continue in your series looking at 1 Timothy and what God has entrusted to us. God's entrusted so many great things to us and one of the things that he's entrusted to us is leadership, is good leaders. So um, I know you've got good leaders there because I know the character, I know the heart of Ian and his team and they've been such an encouragement to me and to us up here and they've been connected in with some other really great leaders worldwide through a thing called Launch which of course many of you will also know about and have been involved with and also through the New Thing Network which helps to provide something of a, of a family for us to be able to long, belong to in terms of mutual accountability and encouragement. So I'm looking forward to reading this with you from 1 Timothy and chapter 3. Good morning Restore, my name is Karen Husker, Aka Kaza if I'm on live stream and I'm from the Winchmore Hill Gathering and I'm doing the reading this morning which is 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 13 reading from the NIV UK. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 13. Here is a trustworthy saying, Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, I'm just going to pray for Anthony before he speaks to us. Dear Lord Jesus, we pray for Anthony as he speaks through this word. We pray that you'll give him wisdom by your spirit. And we pray for those of us who are listening, that you'll challenge our hearts in any, any area that needs challenging. And give us, give us wisdom and insight into um, our own hearts and what does need to change. Be with us this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, some uh, translations headline this as qualifications of church leadership. And Paul here is going to list qualifications for leading God's way. And he says people should be tested first. Because, as John Maxwell said, everything rises or falls on leadership. I think as much, if not more, than any other organisation, a church will reflect its leaders. The life of the church, its decline or growth, what's important as the ministry of the church, the generosity of the church, the testimony of the church, the impact, the reputation, the integrity, the feel of the church, the health of the church is dependent on the leadership of the church. As you can look at a church over time, you will observe, you can discover by the nature of its ministry, the kind of leadership it has, and vice versa. In Luke's Gospel, 
Jesus said, when someone is fully discipled, the student will be like the teacher. It's inevitable that you become like the one who teaches you. Something rubs off, which means there's a lot at stake here. Paul knew that as a leader, he was a flesh and blood model. He told the churches that he led, follow me as I follow Christ. By the way, if I'm not following Christ, don't follow me or any other leader. And the Bible provides leadership checklists and today's passage is one of the clearest. But please don't just put me or, or anybody else against this high standard and see how you far this particular leader might fall or that one might in your estimation. Measure yourself against this and see how far you can grow in influence, call, in character and in Christ. Paul started the church at Ephesus and led it for three years. Then he travelled on and as we've seen, he sent Timothy back. Why? Because some false teachers who wanted to attract a following themselves but hated godly appointed leaders had infiltrated the church and were in danger insidiously of taking it over. Teaching heresies, approving of immorality and spreading lies. So he tells Timothy, you've got to sort this out, get the leadership right. They've been lax about who gets a position of influence and Paul knows and sees how dangerous that is because people follow people and some are being led astray. So he lists what somebody appointed to any position of authority ought to be like. Some are prominent, others less so. Later on, people made these into positions and titles, but whatever the call is, or you call it, none of the qualifications are about gifts or charisma, because we can be easily fooled by that. The tests are all about character, trusted character, because eventually what's on the inside will show on the outside, and it's way better to find that out sooner rather than later. I was on a plane getting settled for takeoff back in the day when that was fairly routine. But then we were told we'd have to sit and wait a while because of some checks that were being made. Maybe you've had that happen. An hour later they said, sorry, everybody off, back on the buses, we've detected a fault. And many hours after we went on another plane. And yet yeah, it was a pain at the time. But you know what, I'd rather they found the fault out before we took off than at 40,000 feet. That would go way beyond an inconvenience. I'm really glad that the pilot and the crew did those checks and made the call rather than say, let's just get up there and hope nothing falls off. I'm glad the pilots and the crew are tested too because the only time you let just anybody fly the plane, it's a disaster movie. Paul talked already in this letter in chapter one about people who confidently wanted to teach but knew nothing about what they were teaching. These days with the internet, that's easy to do. Copy and paste other people's sermons rather than bring what God told or showed to you. He names two men. Then in chapter two, he says others were trying to overturn authority and push their own pagan practices in the church. In chapter four after this, he's gonna talk about seduction and lies and doctrines of demons. People not teaching the truth or living it out because what you believe comes out in how you behave. And again, vice, vice versa is also true. He says some were just in it for the money. Others wanted to stir up division and disputes about words that led to envy and strife. And then here in chapter three, the message, the way it reads, starts, if anybody wants to provide leadership in the church, good, but there are preconditions. So what's the preconditions? What's the filter on leadership? How do we learn to discern, not just for others, but for ourselves? This is such a rich, rich study. But I'm going to pick some things out and encourage you to go deeper in your own study of this. The first word I want to look at, you can write this down, is call. Verse 1 here literally says, if, if somebody stretches towards being a presbyter, an overseer, an elder, even a bishop, different churches give different titles. That's not what matters. Um, it, says, it says this, they have a good longing. It's a good thing to long for leadership. Charles Spurgeon, in his book, Lectures to My Students on the Art of Preaching, said, if you can do, possibly can do anything else other than this, do so. The idea is a call means you know you couldn't possibly do anything else, but God is bringing you into something new. And there's something here about being extended beyond just being a follower when God takes hold of you and says, trust me, I've got more for you. And you know what? You want it too. There's a call. That doesn't mean, you know, everything it involves up front or you just think, oh, I can do that easily. Most people who are genuinely called start out just knowing how inadequate they are naturally. But they make themselves available for the supernatural work because our availability is more important than our ability to God. 
When it first happened to me, I was 22, and I ended up on the floor of my bedroom, actually stretched out before the most tangible sense of God's presence. There was this fear of God, a sense of my own unworthiness and unholiness, but as I gave myself back to him again, I knew I wouldn't be in the police forever. Though up until then, that was all I'd ever wanted to do with my life. I knew somehow if I kept following him, one day I'd find myself just telling people about Jesus all the time. And it was weirdly terrifying and exciting at the same time. I didn't know how I could do it, but I also knew I wanted to do it. See, God wasn't going to use me in spite of me because he wants co-laborers. That's another word you can write down who will work with him, full-time, paid or unpaid, all in for him, the best that you've got, doing everything, giving everything for him. And for me, it ended up, ended up with me not only working for him, but also working for the church. And these leaders that Paul's talking about, by the way, very few of them would receive payment for their serving, though we'll see as we read on that some did. It's not about pay, it's God's looking for character character write that word down paul then tells timothy to check character and you don't do that uh, from a cv but by observing conduct write that word down too jesus said by their fruit you'll know them sometimes that's obvious sometimes it takes time but there are tests for these c's and he lists them whether somebody's serving prominently and publicly up front or in some other place of leadership in church because that word deacon just means servant there are some characteristics that have to be in place for both. If they're married, one partner. You can't be sexually active outside of that or have multiple or affairs. Now, of course, it doesn't mean you have to be married to lead, just that if you are, remember, one husband or one wife is plenty. Thank you very much. Monogamy was actually the rule generally in the Roman Empire. You could only have one official wife, though they did have concubines and friends with benefits of either sex that was tolerated but Paul says no for us it's one husband and one wife for life as we say in the marriage service forsaking all others for better for worse till death do us part the other shared qualifications male or female because notice he says the women likewise are not to be addicted to wine or to be a heavy drinker that's self-control so God can trust you with more and anybody who wants to lead can't be greedy or just in it for the money you can see these things are listed here and you can see them when they show up in people's lives they have to be able to manage their own household well because God's looking for people he can trust his kids to his family too. If you have children, you're going to be careful with the babysitters, aren't you? I hope you wouldn't just let anybody look after them. And that's not because you're being judgmental or harsh. It's because you love your kids. And this says this is God's family, God's church. He loves his family. He wants to protect us from evil and harm. So those are the basic must-haves for leadership. It doesn't say anywhere that you have to look cool, or you have to have tattoos, or great social media presence, following, etc. But it lists a few other specifics, which are for those who may want and may end up publicly up front, elders, overseers of the church, and for those who are deacons and servant leaders in any area. So, overseers. In our world where I'm at, I'd say that's elders, staff team, prominent leadership, who are meant to be, it says here, above reproach. Some translations say blameless. Wow, this is a scary standard, isn't it? it well, it should be for me because that means I have to have a fear of the Lord because that's the beginning of wisdom. To step up to this kind of leadership, you have to be sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. I check myself against that list and soon I'm going to have an appraisal anyway with the elders, but I realise I'm going to be appraised by the Lord on all these things too. And you know, it's hard. It's hard at the moment to be hospitable these days, isn't it? But it's a spirit more than an action. Not violent or quarrelsome. That was something God had to deal with me in the past, especially because of my background in the police. But gentle. Jesus says we all have to come to him and take his yoke and learn from him because he is gentle and humble. Not a new convert. I have to admit, I've got that wrong over the years. Promoting people to positions of leadership above their level of maturity. Usually because I wanted to believe the best about them or sometimes just because I needed a gap filling, if I'm honest, but it always bites you in the end. He says literally that can blind them with pride and leave an opening for spiritual attack. Finally, we've all seen too much what happens when somebody in a position of prominent leadership falls into what he calls here disgrace. 
how outside, outsiders get to see that, the damage it does to the whole church. So he says, protect the church as best you can by testing first, putting accountability in, and holding leaders to a higher standard or removing them. Be otherwise, one day it'll all blow up midair. God is not mocked. What was secret will be uncovered. And sometimes that's actually God's severe mercy at work because he wants a holy church to represent him. If you want to be stretched by God to lead, and this isn't even in a public or prominent way, in any area, and by the way, you can't lead if you won't serve, then as well as those shared character questions, there are a few filters for you to consider. And we should look at these too when people step up and say, I want to lead in this way in the church. I want to start this new ministry on the church, church's behalf. He says, you should be tested first. The church hasn't always been great at this because we'd rather be nice than biblical. But if we ever have to, you know, if a church leadership ever has you to wait and says, actually, we, we, you know, and you then end up saying, what do you mean? Why have I got to wait? Well, you may have failed one of the first tests anyway. You're just proving it again because patience is a test. He says you must show by how you live that you're worthy of respect. And with your lips, you're not dialogos, double tongued. We might say two faced. You know what that means? Sometimes Christians are the worst at this, not being straight, saying one thing to one and another one to somebody else, not to their faces, talking behind their backs. He adds in another about not slandering. And the word really there is diabolos because it's diabolical what people say. We have to watch our mouths because God is listening. Instead, he says, you must hold the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. What does that mean? It means you have a good grasp on what Christians believe, what the Bible says, and you're trying to live it out and order your life accordingly. This phrase is like, look after the pearl of great price. Just remember how precious Jesus is. Guard what he's given you really well, because the final C, really it's the first and the last, because that's who he is. The big C for Christian leadership is Christ. If it's all about him, then it's not about me. It's all about him. It's all about Christ. This is the final filter. That's why I love how Paul just had to finish this chapter saying how great Jesus is, how great it is to know Jesus. He says, I can't wait until I come and see you, Timothy. And then he just writes this little poem about Jesus, about his saviour, just because he loves Jesus. See, this is the final test, the real test, that people really love Jesus. I had the privilege of meeting Louis Palau. He really was an amazing man. And Francis Chan sent a message to the family just before his recent funeral that said this. He said, while I was impressed by his graciousness and charisma on the stage, I was far more impacted by the kindness he exuded in everyday life. He was warm, which ought to be true of those filled with light, but often is not the case. He said, what I most remember was the way he shared with our taxi driver. The gospel flowed so naturally from his lips. It wasn't forced or spoken out of obligation. I thank God that Lewis could preach the gospel faithfully for so many years on large platforms and taxi rides. I've worked with people in churches. They had skills and gifts, but then I thought, you know what? Wow, you, you never seem to talk about Jesus. You never told me how he met you or changed your life. I never heard that story. You don't seem to tell anybody else about him unless it's some kind of official thing that you're getting paid for. What's that about? Is that about him or is it about you? But Paul just has to praise the one who saved him. And he writes this little thing about how great the good news is and what Jesus did for us. And just reading it again makes me want to worship him too. Maybe where you are now, you can start to worship him. In the Passion Version, this ends by saying, now you know how to conduct the affairs of the church of the living God, his very household and the supporting pillar and firm foundation of the truth. For the mystery of righteousness is beyond all question. He was revealed as a human being, as our great high priest in the spirit. Angels gazed upon him as a man and the glorious message of his kingly rulership is being preached to the nations. Many have believed in him and he has been taken back to heaven and ascended into the place of exalted glory in the heavenly realm. Yes, great is this mystery of righteousness.